Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time, Lord God, to have where this part of the service, Lord God, is the only uh, part, Lord God, where, where you allow us to hear your word, God. We pray, God, that you would speak to us, Lord God. We pray, God, that you would have your way. And we ask, Lord God, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers, Lord. May your will be done, God. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Give us insight and revelation. Holy Spirit, have your way, God. Begin to work on our hearts. Begin to work on our minds, God. And most definitely begin to work in our lives, God, for your glory. In Jesus' name, and everybody says, amen. amen. Let's give it up for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so today, as you guys see on the, uh, the screen, today's message is called The Power of Influence. We are still in the book of Mark. Actions speak louder than words. And today, our message will be coming from Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through verse 30. Amen. And so, as we said, we're going through the book of Mark. It looks like we're probably being here maybe for the rest of this year. What do you think, Darren? The rest of this year, probably till next year or something? Right? See how it works out? <laughs> Amen. And so, we definitely, there's no rush in this thing, right? If God comes in the middle of it, praise God. You know what I mean? If God comes in the end of it, praise the Lord. Amen? But we're going to continue to learn about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and apply Him to our lives. Amen? And so, the power of influence. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, what kind of influence is in your life? <laughs> Amen? The Word of God says in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 30, Jesus and his disciples went out to the villages around Caesarea of Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And so giving some context here, Mark has brought us to the climactic point of his gospel through the, through the actions of Jesus, the Christ that has been speaking louder than words through the many miracles, signs, and wonders executed by the Lord. We have seen that as we've been on this journey from chapter 1 on down, right? that Jesus is doing all type of miracles, all type of signs, all type of wonders that are getting the people's attention, but yet and still there is influence all around that. Amen? And so he comes to this point right here where now Mark shifts gears in a sense where now Jesus is on his journey, his last journey we'll call it, heading toward Jerusalem. And he's heading there for one reason and one reason only. And it is to die on the cross, to be buried and resurrect. Amen? And so while on this journey, what's going to begin to happen, as we've seen uh, last week, we talked about uh, individual, the individual's sight coming back to him, right? The blind man receiving his sight. And we learned what happened when it came down to spiritual blindness and what God was trying to do within our own lives. Before that, we talked about the East. And the effects of the yeast of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians, right? Representing, you know, religiosity, representing an unspiritual life, and lastly with the Herodians, representing a worldly life. And the yeast that comes through those things to affect Christians and non-Christians alike so that they can receive, it's, it's similar to like a cancer that begins to spread to the body and they begin to die. And they die because of this yeast. And then we see Jesus dealing with his disciples. He ends up utilizing, as we talked about last week, the blind man and opening up his eyes. That now brings us to this place where Jesus is now going toward uh, Caesarea Philippi, right, in a village around that territory. And so he's, been, he's done many miracles, many signs, many wonders, uh, many wonders. And so like a mountaineer climbing Mount Everest, Mark's gospel describes Jesus hiking up a mountain, one miracle, one sign, and one wonder at a time in the hopes to influence his followers and the world regarding who he is. From Jesus' first exorcism in Mark chapter 1, you'll find that in verse 21 through 28, to the healing of the blind man in Mark 8 chapter 22 verse 26, Jesus has been attempting to influence his disciples, his followers, and hearers towards his true identity. Now reaching the climax of his actions, he turns to his disciples and asks the most important question he could ever ask his disciples, in which he asks us today, who do people and who do you say that I am? 
Who do people and who do you say that I am? This question is a question asked by Jesus, considering the power of influence that surrounded the disciples and the people at large, which would inevitably be answered based on the power of influence rendered and accepted by the people and the disciples themselves. Now we have to understand all of us face some kind of powerful influences on a daily basis. We're getting influenced uh, by billboards. We're getting influenced by commercials. We're being influenced by movies and, excuse me, and infomercials within the movies. We're being influenced by music. We're being influenced by, you know, the trends that come up. We're being influenced by social media. Some of us are being influenced by our children. Some of us are being influenced by our family members, our spouses. Throughout a day-to-day -day basis, all of us are facing powerful influences and ultimately will affect our ability to answer the Lord's question and that proven not only by our verbal answers, but even more on the way we live our lives based on, an, on our answers and the power of influence behind our answers. Influence is crucial. It happens all over the place. It happens intentionally. It happens intentionally, right? Uh, un unintentionally. It happens even when you're not expecting it. It happens that you're walking in Walmart and somebody's singing a song, and all of a sudden you're singing a song, and you're like, why am I singing this song? But because somebody on the next aisle was singing the song. I was walking in Walmart in the, in the parking lot, and this brother jumps out of the car, and then uh, his wife was driving the car, so he, he jumps up and he's dancing as his wife comes out. And he was, I don't even think I could sing the song that he was singing, right? But I was telling my wife about it, and all of a sudden, the song stuck in my head, right? It was a song for married people. And so the song had stuck in my head, and I'm singing as I'm driving. I'm like, why in the world is this song in my head? But bam, I was influenced just that fast by this dude jumping out the car, and he's singing to his wife a song that has to do with married people, right? And so I'm like, and it was a good song at that, you know what I mean? It's stuck, right? And so some of us here, we, we go through the same thing, right? All of a sudden, like somebody could be whistling or kind of like, you know, doing a little beat, and we know the beat, and then all of a sudden, we're not just doing the beat, but we're singing the song to that beat. We've been influenced. And then all of a sudden, you know what I mean, somebody's singing Tupac for, the, for those of us that, that was raised in that era. And all of a sudden, right, my ambition is a rider and, you know what I mean, all these other things or whatever. And Yeah, you know what I mean. And there's a heaven for a gangster, so I can be a gangster and a Christian. I don't care what you say. And then we're all on this stuff and we're like, wait a minute, why in the world am I thinking about smoking weed and, and I wish somebody would run up on me right now? Because all of a sudden, that song influenced our minds that in turn influenced our behavior, even whether it be positive or negative. Because we can, you know, Christian songs, we do that too. All right, man, pray. that's a good song. Yeah. But then negative songs come too. And all of a sudden, you know what I mean, Usher comes on, nice and slow or something like that, right, an old school track. And you're like, you know, you're thinking about this stuff. And then all of a sudden, it takes you back to a certain time where your heart got broken. And all of a sudden, let's say you're married now, and your wife is on the passenger seat, and you're singing this song in your head, and you're just like, you know, whatever, you look at her and you're just like, oh, I'm going to take it all out on you now. You know what I mean? And it influenced us that now we have an attitude for absolutely no reason. No reason at all. And so influence is powerful. Amen? Can we all agree to that? The definition of influence is to affect or alter. Somebody say alter. By indirect or intangible means, which in, in lame terms is influencing one's decisions. The other definition is to have an effect on the condition or development of influencing a person's actions. Through this, through this definition here, it shows us clearly the power of influence. When influence comes, it begins to affect us. It begins to alter us. It affects the decisions even that we make that day. There's some people who ain't in church today because this morning they woke up and they were influenced by the tiredness of their body. And they said, you know what, I'm going to find an excuse. I'm just going to say I have COVID or some, or some random stuff, right, right? Uh, a pigeon hit my, my window this morning, man, and I've been up all night, you know, or whatever it is. Oh, man, I only slept for an hour, man, because I played video games for 12 hours. And so wh whatever it is, right, but it, it begins to alter and affect by indirect or intangible means. And then the other one is to have an effect, e effect, on the condition 
or development or influencing a person's actions. This is to say that the power of influence in which we allow to affect our intellect, our emotions, our decisions, our perspectives, our outlooks will ultimately affect our actions, our living, our priorities, our endeavors, our dreams, our character, our attitudes, and our behavior. That's how deep influence goes. It begins to almost like search out every part and anatomy of your human nature. It begins to go into the crevices of our thoughts, the crevices of our feelings and our emotions. It even goes into the crevices of our very livelihood that it starts to influence us and affect us that ultimately will affect our attitudes and our behavior. I'm telling you, it is so powerful that our children can do something and we can lose it mentally. Influence is so powerful that right here, even sitting in this church, we can begin to implode because we're afraid to explode. Because of the influence, even of the pastor's sermon, the influence of a scripture, the influence of a song or worship. During worship, I could hear people crying and hear people going after God, hear people speaking in tongues and, and people just worshiping. Why? Because they're influenced by the spirit of God. They're influenced by the peace that he gives us. And then there's some who do absolutely nothing because they're influenced by their flesh. And they're influenced like, I ain't doing nothing. I know I ain't put my makeup on today. I didn't shave my head. You know what I mean? Whatever it is, I ain't doing nothing. I'm just going to be right here and I'm going to cavil- you know, just kind of like, I'm going to stay in my skin and I'm going to worship God. And I'm very, very, you know what I mean, like uptight about it. I'm just, thank you, Jesus. You ever see somebody worship, worship the Lord but like very, very robotic? And they were passionate about it. Jesus, you're so awesome. I love you. You guys know what I'm talking about? No expression. And it's like, man, because if I do it, my makeup may crack or something like that. Or I might start tearing. I got to go up there. Boogers start coming out. And now I got boogers, you know, whatever. Whatever the reason is, right? But the thing is, is because we're influenced by something. It's, we're influenced by a thought. We're influenced by, man, how does my breast smell? Right? We're influenced by, man, what is my neighbor going to do? If I put up my hands right now, right, and just kind of go after God like I do in my closet, what is, what is people going to think about me? What about if I got stains of my deodorant on my shirt and I didn't even realize it? We start being influenced by the very stupidest things in our thoughts. You guys know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all did that today. It's okay, right? Some of the kids, that, you know, they're, they're like, man, they're influenced. Like, look, I want to be a kid right now, but I know if I go up there or whatever, I'm going to lose my ever-loving mind. So I'm just going to stay in my chair because I might get something thrown at me, right? So I'm just going to just be right here. I'm just going to worship in my chair. And I can, like, literally see Lily just kind of running up and just, just running around the church like she wants to. But it's like, I can't do that because I might go in timeout, and I don't want to go in timeout. You know what I mean? And she was influenced by that timeout, right? And so influence is so powerful that it affects all these things, right? The Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Amplified Version, test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith and living your lives as committed believers. I got to read that part again, man, because I love how it talks about verbal and living, right? Test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, right, where it talks about faith, and then expresses that faith, and living your lives as committed believers. Examine yourself. Somebody say examine yourselves. Not me. I like how Paul adds that in there. Yeah, you guys see that on the screen? Nice size screen, black and white. I put it, make sure everybody can see it just in case we're colorblind like me. You can see this, right? I want to point at this. Can, we, can I teach a little bit? Examine yourselves. And then look what it says right here. Everybody said this. Not me. Y'all afraid to say this. It's okay. Say it loudly. Not me. Not me. Why is that important? Can I tell you guys why? Why is it important? Because we are so susceptible when it comes down to examination that I'm going to examine the pastor rather than examine myself. I'm going to examine my neighbor rather than myself. Look at him. Wearing that hat in church. Somebody, you know, some folks be, I don't care about people wearing hats. But I remember one day I was going to a church and a person literally stopped me. I think they were going to pray for me. Like, I need some prayer, right? No, they just stopped me to say, hey, can you, you're so wrong or whatever. Look at you wearing that hat in church. And I'm like, what? Like, I just, my hair is jacked up. I just got a hat on. You know what I mean? I just, but she really came at me like, Hardcore, bro. I didn't even know this lady. I was there for like five years. You know what I mean? It was like, you don't, I don't even know your name. You don't even know my name. But you got a nerd to come up and tell me about some religious stuff about a hat being on my head? Stop yourself, man. You know what I mean? 
And so the thing is, I want you to examine yourself and God, before you talk about my hat, I want you to shake my hand and ask me what my name is. So then I can know your name. And then afterwards, maybe you can rebuke me or talk to my wife or something, right? Because he was a female. And so the whole thing is, we're so quick to examine not ourselves, but other people. Well, look what they did. And I'll just use myself, right? Because you can read, I, I don't read books on this stuff, right? Things like that. People come to church, and the whole time they're, heard, they're hearing the message, but they're not really hearing the message. They're coming to church, man, to put their stuff up, right? Put their nose in the air, right? Kind of cross their leg, and all they're doing is judging the past the whole time. I'm going to examine to see how many words today he can mess up. That's, I'm talking about my family members on that one and maybe, maybe a, a leader in the church. And so pray for them, right? Let me see how many words he's going to mess up today. And I missed the whole message, right? But what did I talk about in point two? I don't know. All I know is that you messed up point one when you said this word and it was the wrong word and it was so funny that I took the whole church. And so the, the reality is they come to church to examine the pastor to see if the pastor's a racist, to see if the pastor is all jacked up. Does he have one side of it? You know what I mean? And he's, he's forgetting the other side. Is it all about everybody else, but he doesn't put himself on blast? So many things that they do with the pastor. And then the whole time they leave, and the only thing they recognize was absolutely nothing other than the pastor was bald, and yeah, he made me laugh a couple of times. But did you receive anything? No, I, I couldn't even hear. Why not? Because we're influenced by the examination of everybody else rather than myself. Let me go into church and see how many white people are in the church. Let me go into church and count how many Hispanics are in the church. You guys think I'm playing, but this is some serious stuff that people do. Let me see how many people are bald, because if they bald, they're definitely going through some stress, and I don't need that stuff. I need somebody with all their hair on there because I know they got time for me. They're not overburdened, right? Weird stuff. I'm, I'm telling you guys some weird stuff, but it happens. Paul is encouraging us to examine ourselves, not the next man. Not your wife when you go home, right? Maybe. Or your husband, right? Maybe. Kids, whatever. But really examine yourselves, not me. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves by an ongoing experience that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as counterfeit. You got to love Paul in his writing. And so the thing is, it's, it's so awesome, challenging, direct. It'll punch you in the face sometimes. It'll cause you to say, what in the world is this? There's so many things in the Bible. There's a donkey that talks in the Bible, literally talks and speaks the language of that person. Some of y'all are thinking about Shrek. I am not talking about Shrek at all. I'm talking about in the Bible, there's a donkey that can talk, bro. God opens up his mouth and it talks. Some of y'all are going to be like, false doctrine. I'm talking about the Quran or, or, or the, the, the Jehovah Witness Bible. I'm not talking about none of those things. But it's in the Bible. And so this is the thing, right? The awesome and, and, and crucial part of the Bible is that it literally is up in our face and it's personal. And then it offends you if you're not influenced by the Spirit, but instead influenced by our flesh. Because we will look away like, I'm just going to pretend. I'm not, I didn't just see that in the Scripture that it says, oh, are you a counterfeit? What? Man, I'll be calling me no counterfeit God. What's wrong with you, Paul? That's why I don't read Paul that. I'll just stick with Jesus and all the love Scriptures. But we've been in in the gospel for about a year or so now, and I have not come across any cute scriptures that people tend to, whatever, right? And so the whole thing is, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected, that's a counterfeit. You might look to your neighbor and ask them if they're a counterfeit. But don't wait for the answer. Just kind of put it out there. So you can kind of like just have that on your chest. You're like, man, am I a counterfeit, man? Like, I felt that. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like that wasn't a question. Like, it was a statement or something. Like, you know what I mean? Don't punch them, though, man, but just, you know. And so this is the thing, right? Jesus has been putting in the work to help influence his disciples and the people thus far. Just like a great professor, he has prepared their midterm exam, and that not without a study guide of actions done on his behalf to influence their answers toward the correct ones. Praise God for an awesome teacher. Like a great leader, Jesus is inspecting what he's expecting of his disciples and that on the heights of his mission, which will be followed by the journey of going down the same mountain they have peeped at towards Jesus' final act of dying on the cross at Calvary. Just like the disciples had their, just like the disciples had their midterm exam, we too must examine ourselves to make sure that our faith is not influenced towards the wrong answers that influence wrong living. Hence the question, are we counterfeits? 
Doubt can be answered based upon the influence that, that, that affects us to answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say that he is? Through this next section of the Gospel of Mark, we can, or through this next section of the Gospel of Mark, we can learn four powers of influence as described in the text to better examine ourselves to assure we are being affected by the right power of influence to test ourselves daily to assure we are not counterfeit Christians, but tested and approved Christians who are committed to Christ verbally and confirming through our active living for Christ. The first power of influence as seen in the text is the influence of the culture. The influence of the culture. I know we're going through our um, we're going through our uh, Bible study series, and it's called Culture Wars, right? And so I really want to dive into this first section as the Bible talks about this stuff, right? In verse 27, it says this, right? Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, or Philippi, whatever, however, however you want to pronounce it. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? The name Caesarea, to give us some background here to understand why the influence of the, of, of the culture comes up in this verse is because of this. Listen carefully to the context here. The name Caesarea is after the emperor Caesar and is followed by Philippi after the ruler Philip, who was one of the sons of Herod. This city is not the same city as the coastal city Caesarea. So we have to understand this is a whole different city, right? This city was known for the worship of false gods and idols in which Philip beautified and named after Caesar to honor Caesar and himself. The city was known for its worship of the god Pan, whose image was that of a fawn or that likened of, a, of parts of a goat with its horns and legs and some parts like a man or half god and half goat. He is the god of the wild, the god of the shepherds and flocks, nature, and mountains, as well as nymphs, right? Where we get the, the word nympho, right? He is the god of the nymphs or sexual or erotic pleasures who encourage wild and free living. He is the fawn with the pan flutes who like playing music to place people within a trance to indulge in sexual and wild living and the worship of the culture. This is very similar. How many people have seen uh, the movie um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? You guys remember that fawn? Mr. Thomas, right? Remember the girl, the little girl? Lucy goes through the closet. She ends up bumping into... Uh, <laughs> this brother's pretty good with these movies. Man. That was pretty good. That was good. I got to acknowledge that. Let's give it up for the brother, man, and watching Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, man, this man got it. And so he meets... Uh, with Thomas, or she meets with Thomas, Thomas takes her to his house. You guys remember that? And he's talking to her, right, trying to deceive her, trying to, you know what I mean, get her mind going. But what does he do inside the house? He pulls out the pan flute. The fire's going. And he begins to play the, plan, the, the pan flute. And what happens to Lucy? She goes into a trance. The fire starts becoming an image there. And she falls into a deep sleep. They got that from the god Pan of history, who he's known to look like a half god and a half coat, a goat. And guess what he's about? He's about the culture. He's about wild living. He's about the arts. He's about music. And he loves to play that plan, that pan flute to put people in a trance, right? Guess what trance is similar to? Influence. It is to play the flute or play that plant, that pan flute to influence individuals to begin to the worship of the very culture to which they live in. And he does it through wild living, liberalism, freedom, do whatever you want to do, right? Nymphs and all that other stuff, right? I can't go into the deep parts of that, right, for hearers' sake. But listen, it gets real crazy. And the crazy part about it is that when you look at it, guess what kind of society and culture we're living in today? Exact same one. 
but it's the exact same one, but probably even worse, because we are living in times where it's way worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we have to understand that he's putting us into a trance. The influence of the culture is similar to playing the flute and putting people into a trance or influencing the masses to worship the very culture. And what begins to happen? It starts to taint. It starts to disrupt of how we answer that question. Who do you say I am? Who do people say I am? He's talking about influence here. And so this was a perfect place to ask the disciples the question, who do people say I am? After conducting miracles, signs, and wonders up until this point of his ministry and his journey amid the people and his disciples, Jesus wanted to know who did the people say that he was. Caesarea Philippi can represent the influence of the culture upon the people considering who Jesus was and the influence he attempted to have upon them regarding himself. Culture is defined as the customs, the arts, social institutions, and achievements of particular nation, people, or others. False gods and idols that stem from the culture are powerful influences that affect the people and their ability to see Jesus for who he is. Jesus could have asked the disciples this question in any other geographical place, but he chose with intentionality to ask them around the villages of Caesarea Philippi, knowing the type of culture it was and the power of influence the culture can have upon the person of Jesus, or at least upon us and the person of Jesus and how we define him. It is the influence of the culture that is a powerful influence that has, as we see, has influenced believers and non-believers alike. And we're talking about on a mass scale. In fact, the culture has become so powerful in its influence that we now have a whole world singing and dancing to the same tune. The whole world. It's no longer just America or like Chicago doing something New York doing something, California doing something. No, it's of the U.S. of A., it's of Mexico, South America, Europe, and all these other places, and Iraq, and all these other places. Listen, it's all over the world. They're singing the same cultural tune. And you got to wonder what kind of pan flute they have in their house playing that is influencing them and sending them off when it comes down to the question, who do people say Jesus is? From prestigious colleges such as Yale, Princeton, and Harvard, who used to be Christian colleges and founded by Christian organizations who once taught the precepts and fundamentals of Christ, but has since been affected by the culture and even aiding the culture and influencing the masses away from the person and identity of Christ to such a degree that people who have not only inadequately answered or not truly inadequately answered the question Jesus gives become agnostics and even atheists after attending such schools and colleges as a whole. These were Bible colleges. These were prestigious right, social institutions that taught the things of God. They preached the things of God. They raised up other men and women of God. And now because they were affected to such a degree by the culture itself, they are now preaching against Christ. They no longer look at Jesus the way they used to look at Jesus. They no longer teach about Jesus the way they used to teach about Jesus. And now it's gotten to the point that now people that go to these colleges and any college for that matter that's not a Christian college, they are now affected by a culture. And by the time you end that four years or two years or whatever degree you want to get in that college, by the end of that, you're already lost. You haven't been affected by the influence of that culture to such a degree that when somebody asks you, man, who do you say Jesus is? Well, he's a good person. He used to be a Lord and Savior, but after doing the studies in, in, in Bible college and, or in college and the stuff that they were telling me, yeah, I, I believe in science now. Oh, I just believe that there's some God out there and he's kind of flying around with his little, you know, his little angels, you know, little naked babies, with, you know, whatever, with the little wings. And, you know, he's out there just doing whatever he does. You know, he's a God out there. You know what I mean? And the thing is, we will put more faith in, in the Greek gods than we put Jesus Christ. Some of us even know more about Greek mythology than we knew about the Bible and Jesus Christ. It is the influence of the culture, the influence of movies, the influence of the arts, 
the influence of these things that have influenced us powerfully, that we can no longer look at Jesus the way we're supposed to. We can no longer answer this question with truth and adequacy and, and correctness because of the influence of the culture. And some of us, man, it's just like it's nothing. We don't even see it. We, we, it's like it's right in front of us, and we're like, nah, that can't be it. That's just Steve just giving his own interpretation. He's so cute. You know what I mean? He's just, you can't take him serious. You know what I mean? He's just really, you know, he's kind of out there. You know what I mean? But it's the word of God. I am preaching from the word of God. I ain't preaching from Steve's book. I don't even have a book. Well, I'm about to. Praise God. Praise him. But you guys know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm preaching from the Bible. Amen? And so listen, the culture has and continues to be a powerful influence upon the people and affecting their ability to see and honor Jesus for who he truly is, both the Messiah and Son of God. Instead, the culture has created its own gods and idols in, with, in which influences the people towards the worship and elevation of the culture and the things that represent it while demanding the God who created and must be above the culture or demoting the God who created and must be above the culture. We have a shift now in deities. We have a shift now in influence and a shift now in elevation. That now the culture is elevating itself while it's demoting God himself. So what begins to happen is the more the, 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 the one that's elevated is the more influence that's becoming out of that individual or for that matter the culture itself that is affecting the masses that God now is being demoted in the sense of worship, in the sense of influence. So while you come to church and you can hear a message like this, but because the culture is so strong within our lives, listen, it goes in one ear and out the other. Some of us would even say amen. Some of us will clap and be like, man, that's right on the money, but it doesn't apply to me. It doesn't influence me because I'm going to go home and worship the culture that I just came out of. Because the culture is elevated and exalted in one's life while God is being demoted in our lives. And you know what happens? Just like it happens with sin itself. That we begin to hire the flame of sin and the volume of sin while we lower down the flame and the volume of the Spirit of God. That while the Spirit of God is trying to influence us towards God himself, right? towards the things of God, towards the word of God. We can no longer hear him, let alone be influenced by him, because the only thing we can hear and see and be affected by is the fire that we have elevated, the fire that we have turned up within our life called sin, or in this case called culture. And God is trying to get our attention. And he's saying, what kind of power of influence is operating within our lives today? What kind of pan flute is playing in our ears even right now? Amen? And so we are influenced by the customs of our culture, the arts such as the music that influences people into a trance of unhealthy living, violence, depression, self-exaltation, and wild and perverse living. We elevate and are influenced by our social institutions and achievements or, or nations, people and other things that influence us and our inability to see Christ for who he is and what he has done. We're influenced by all these things. And so look what Romans says, all right? Very, very, ah, uh, scripture, right? I know we try to deny this, but this is the Bible. I got I to gotta read it, y'all. For although they knew God, anybody knew God? Past tense, right? Although they knew God, right? Some of us, or if not all of us, we know God to a certain degree, right? They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile. Futile means useless. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And look at what they did. They exchanged, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Sound familiar to the, the culture of Caesarea? Half man, half, uh, half goat, half God. And so they elevated these things above the creator God. And they exchanged his glory for the glory of the culture which is happening right before our eyes. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the regarding of their bodies with one another. He's talking about homosexuality. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve. Look at what they start to do. They worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. 
you have an elevation. You have a shift of exaltation. You have a shift of who is God based upon the influence that you are receiving in your life. And now God is now down here while the influence of the culture and the worship of it and the service of it is way up here. And so what happens? We could agree about things about Jesus. And we could even profess them with our mouth. Oh, but our lives will be affected by the one who is influencing us the most. And if it's the culture, it's a no wonder we worship the very created things on this earth. It's a no wonder we put them before God every single day, including God. It's a no wonder that we do all these things when it comes down to created things and put them before the creator while we demote the creator and elevate the creation, which is the very culture and what you're talking about here. Have you been influenced by the power of the culture and have an obscure perspective and clear answer of who Jesus is due to the powerful influence of the culture? That's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Because this is the reality. We, as we started this sermon with, the reality is this. Influence can affect us just like this. Well, I'm telling you, we could, be, we could come out of the church and just skip ourselves to our cars. Just skip, skip, skip to my lead, right? And just skip ourselves just real nice to our cars. And a car can be driving past, banging some music that we used to like. And just like that, it influenced us. Without us even recognizing it or knowing it, we jump in the car and all of a sudden we have a desire to put on Triple Six Mafia. Or whatever y'all listening to this day. You guys know what I'm talking about? And they're like, we just started worshiping. You were probably the one that were right here just crying and pouring your tears. And now you're in the car banging Triple Six Mafia or whoever is the latest dude out there doing his thing, right? Drake or whoever, right? A uh, little Uzi, little Pump, all these little guys, whatever it is, right? And so you end, up, you end up bumping these things. And you wonder, like, how did I even get here? Because just that fast, the influence of that hits you. You don't even realize it. Why am I saying that? Because we need to examine ourselves to make sure. Have we been influenced by the power of the culture to such a degree that while we confess Jesus for who he is, our lives, our minds, our emotions are contrary and even opposite of what is coming out of our mouths. The power of influence. Can we talk about number two? The influence of society. Woo, right? Somebody say society. society. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, don't get caught up. Don't get caught up in society, man, right? The disciples replied to Jesus regarding his question of who do people say I am? We're still dealing with the people. We haven't got to the disciples yet, right? Pray for your pastor, right? And so who do people say I am? Giving the list of people they have heard others uh, say who Jesus was, some said, man, they say you John the Baptist, man, right? We all know what happened to John the Baptist. He definitely wasn't no John the Baptist. Uh, some say, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, according to, they add Jeremiah in there uh, with Matthew 16, 14, but Mark says, or one of the prophets, and so one of the prophets meaning Jeremiah or something like that, right? If the culture represents, listen to this very clearly, okay, especially the fact that, you know, we're talking about culture wars on Wednesday. If the culture represents customs, arts, social institutions, and etc then society is the individual and or groups of people who have been influenced by the culture who attempt to influence others both on a group and individual level. The culture is at a, a large scale, right? Institutions, customs, right? La Dia de los Muertos, all those other things, right? That's culture, you know what I mean? All that, that's on a large scale. But the large scale of the culture, the point of it, and the mission of the ultimate culture is to influence the society that are represented by individuals and groups of individuals within that culture. Do you guys know, understand society now? A little bit about culture? We learning some stuff. Today we have in history and all type of stuff, and God is good. And so let's keep going, amen? Society is defined as a part of community that is a unit distinguishable by particular aims or standards of living or conduct, a social circle or a group of social circles having a clearly marked identity. You can tell by looking at people how they conduct their lives, how they live, if they have been affected by the culture and society. 
That's the definition of it. They hang within groups. After those groups, they go off as individuals and they begin to affect other groups, right? In, in, uh, in psychology, they, they teach you about in-groups and out-groups. The point of the in-groups is that everybody looks the same, right? The point of the out-group is that they're left out because they don't look like and they don't act like the people in the in-group. So what do the in-group people do with the out-group? They begin to persecute them. They begin to push them away, ostracize them. They begin to mistreat them in different ways. But then what you will have is one will eventually permeate in and get into the in-group. They, uh, they would have literally, uh, I would say, adopted an in or out-group person. But the only way they will adopt an out-group person is because the out-group person has to start looking like the in-group people. They're not, allowed, they're not allowed to go within the in-group and have self-identification. They're not allowed to be and remain in that in-group as, as, as long as they act like anything other than the in-group. But as long as they convert and they are conformed, as the Bible says, as the in-group, they can remain in the in-group. The in-group in our society is the very culture that feeds our society, which is straight from the devil himself. While they have some cool things in there and some good music sometimes and some good dancing, right? Some of us like dancing, salsa, merengue, bachata, square dancing, whatever y'all like doing, y'all like doing, right? Those are cool things. But the moment those things start influencing you away from Christ, they're no longer good. Amen? We're talking about society. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6, 14 on down, King Herod heard about this. For Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, uh, uh, and, and that is why mir uh, miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claim he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. This is exactly the response that we're still reading in chapter 8. This is in chapter 6, though. And they got a report. They didn't even ask for it, but this is what they're saying. Jesus is, you know, people are saying he's John the Baptist, he's Elijah, or he's one of the prophets. The interesting part when I, got, when I was doing the study and I came across this was the fact of, wait a minute, this is like almost three chapters ago. Why is it that they're still saying the same thing, right? I think that's a good, fair question. And so society influenced the people regarding who Jesus was to such a degree that they could not be influenced by Jesus and all the miracles, signs, and wonders he performed that was done to influence people towards his, his true identity. Mind you, this is happening, they're saying this in chapter 6. After chapter 6, he does, a lot of, he does a lot of miracle signs and wonders. But because they're influenced by society so much, they've seen the wonders, they've seen the signs, they've seen the miracles, and it did absolutely nothing within their lives. It didn't change their answer when it came down to Jesus. John chapter 20, verse 30 says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is the purpose of signs, wonders, and miracles. It was to get people to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But because the influence of society was so powerful, they couldn't, they couldn't connect it. They couldn't even see it, let alone be influenced by Jesus himself. This declaration of the people was first declared in Mark 6, 14 to 4, uh, 15, as we read, due to the influence of society and all the miracles, signs, and wonders done by Jesus, they were unable, or Jesus was unable to influence the people because people were under the influence of society and who they said Jesus was. Mind you, the people that were saying these things were the people that were in society, and they had such influence that it affected others in society that seen all these miracles, and yet and still they couldn't connect the fact that this must be the Messiah, the Son of God. Instead, now he's probably John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, or maybe one of the prophets of long ago. And so look at what he did since chapter 6 of the, of, the, uh, of the reading of the declaration. Since then, this is what he did. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. He healed the sick throughout the region. He cast out the demon from the Phoenician woman's daughter, healed a deaf and mute man, fed 4,000 people, and he healed a blind man. And yet, 
the people's answer of who Jesus was never moved from how they answered and assumed, assumed from before Jesus had done these things. They stayed the absolute same. Now think about this, right? What happens to people who claim to be Christian, who go to church, let, let's say every Saturday, but their influence is influenced by society? According to the word of God here, we're able to sit in church and see miracles. We're able to worship and see signs, right? We're able to literally see wonders of God happen in the midst of us. And even some of us right to us. And yet and still never take the plunge to accept Jesus for who he truly is and who he truly represents. And the reason being is because I see people in that manner who come to church week in and week out. And they come to hear a message to do a check-in. But they're unable to be influenced by Jesus Christ within the service. That they leave the service back into the influence of society and they remain unchanged. Unborn again. They remain a child of society rather than a child of God while claiming to be a child of God. But by their living, they're nothing but children who are influenced by their father. And in this case, society who is ran by the devil. It is for that reason Jesus says, you're not, don't be telling me you're children of Abraham. Don't, I don't want to hear that. He literally, lame term, that's what he's telling the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were affected and influenced by society and the culture. He said, don't be telling me you're children of Abraham because children, I can make rocks of children of Abraham type stuff. He says, no, no, you're just like your father. And then who did he say? The devil. That, that would have, if I was me, that would have hurt so bad. I probably would have stoned Jesus myself after that one, bro. Like, What? You don't call me a child of the devil. You know what I mean? Like, what kind of stuff is that, right? And so last time my brother did that, we were on evangelism. I told some of you guys this, this, this thing. It was about, it was, it was close to 10 p.m. And this man called a dude that was half Muslim and half, claiming to be half Muslim, half Christian. And he called him a child of the devil. And the same people we had just prayed for, preached on, they all surrounded us. And they were about to beat us to a puff inside this organization that got open the door that we were having church at. Literally, right after church, this man calls the other man, you child of the devil. And he wasn't led by the Spirit of God to do it, because sometimes you got to tell people, you're a child of the devil, man, like, for real, for real, right? And so, but this wasn't that time. And then all of a sudden, they're surrounding us, they're cursing at us, and they're about to beat us to a puff. And all I know, man, I looked at my boy, and I, you know, kind of diffused it. I said, listen, man, if we get beat up, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it to Jesus, praise God. But after this, man... We are going to fight, bro, and I ain't going to goose you. I'm, this is a true story, man. I'm literally telling him this, bro. Like, bro, I ain't going to take this whooping for Jesus, man. But after we're done, we're going to fight, bro, all night type stuff. I am so sorry. I literally told him that, bro, right? Because I told him, I said, listen, I could take a whooping for Jesus. In Jesus' name, they ain't whooped me because we're doing God's will. But I will not take a beating for you because you're not doing God's will, and you just want to act in pride and just tell somebody you're a child of the devil. Right? Let's not do that ever again unless the Spirit of God leads you. And then we'll take the whooping just gladly and praise God like, like Peter did. And hallelujah, go home, pumpkin head, where God did got me, baby. Oh, I used to be a kid. God is so good. I'm, I was blessed because I got beat up, right? But I am not getting beat up for any of y'all when we're on evangelism because y'all want to act like outside of God's will, not crazy, and then start taking people's drugs or whatever, doing random stuff, and now all of a sudden they're chasing us with guns. It is going down after that. That's not even a part of the message. That's just my message personally to you guys, okay? This is why I try to train you guys to listen to the Spirit of God so that if we do get shot, at least we're going to glorify God and then, hey, they take our lives. Hey, you know what? It was worth it. But if they take our lives and I see you in heaven, I still remember that. I'm definitely bringing that up with Jesus and you. God, we got to have a teachers and parent conference, man. Like, this is for real, man. Like, I was supposed to be out there still preaching your word, God. And because this brother went on ahead and did something, we got shot and they killed both of them. Matter of fact, they just killed me. He's still alive out there, God. When he comes up here, I want a parent teacher conference. That's what I want. And I'll be very upset, you know what I mean? But seriously, we have to be careful that we're not influenced by the very society we live in. But to make sure we're influenced by God himself, right? I'm going to try to wrap this part up, and we'll do a part two uh, next week. I really try, but I don't want to look at Jerry because she's going to be mad at me.
And so, this shows that they never crossed over to being truly influenced by Jesus, but was content. Hear this word. They were content with the influence of society and who society said Jesus was. The influence of society or other people is a powerful influence that we must examine ourselves from to assure their influence has not affected us. And if it has, remove such influence from our lives and seek the influence of Jesus in accordance with his word. Why would Jesus ask the disciples this question and regard it about what people say and not just flat out go straight to them and say, man, what do you say? You guys ever ask that question when reading this section? Why did Jesus start off with saying, well, well why do, who do people say I am? Like, what difference does it make, right? Why can't he, why, why wouldn't he just go to the disciples who he's with and be like, hey, bro, like, who do y'all say I am? But he goes through this process, and I believe the process is because he's trying to find out about the influence that it's all around him, and, and, and eventually get to the disciples and say, and see, are you going to pass the exam? Or are you going to fail it because of the influence of all the people around you? And right now, we're going through our examination. We're going through the testing, and we're going through all these things because God is trying to show us himself. He is trying to get us to a place where we can answer this question and answer it effectively. Amen? And so I believe he did it with purpose. He did it because he wanted to show the power, the influence of society upon our ability to see and be influenced by Jesus. The answer people gave of who Jesus was, has lessons within themselves about how the influence of society has upon others. And the first person they mentioned was John the Baptist. Some people say, you're John the Baptist. Why do I have to go through this? Because in our day and age today, we people still say the same. They still answer the question the very same way. Hey, maybe he is like a John the Baptist. What does John the Baptist represent? Who was this man? He was the preparer of the coming of Jesus but was not Jesus or the Messiah. Remember, he said, I'm not he. I'm just preparing the way for one who comes after me, whose sandals I cannot untie. He was a preparer of the way. The people were willing to believe in the resurrection of the dead because to believe that he was John the Baptist would have to believe that the resurrection is true and John the Baptist has come back to life and he is now in this person that they're calling Jesus. And so they're willing to believe in the resurrection of the dead, but not willing to see Jesus for who he truly is, the Messiah and the Son of God. John was the preparer of the way, yet society's influence is to keep people united in its way and truths, aims, or standards of living or conduct and remain identified within its own societal construct. You guys see the definition here? Society's aim is to make sure that people do it its way that it follows its conduct of living and standards, and it follows its truth, even though it's not true at all. Are you guys following me? John was the preparer of the way. Society was willing to say that Jesus was John the Baptist or a preparer of the way, but not willing to be influenced by who Jesus, who, by who Jesus was and is as the only way, the only truth, and the only life that left them unaffected by the influence of Jesus due to the powerful influence of society. We have people today that will say Jesus is a good man. Oh, he's a preparer, man. He's a preparer of this, that, and the other. But they're not willing to say he's the Messiah and the Son of God because that comes with consequences. That comes with allegiance. The next person they said is, oh, man, maybe he's Elijah. And they said this because Elijah was expected to come back and with the prophecy according to Malachi, I'll show you guys in a few moments, Malachi uh, talked about, hey, God said, I'm going to send Elijah before I send, before the coming of the Messiah, right? But they didn't understand who, how Elijah would come. In fact, they didn't even understand how the Messiah would come. Elijah was taken up by God and never experienced death. He was one of the greatest prophets of God. And according to Malachi 4, 5, which states, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, which was fulfilled in the prophet, uh, in the prophet John, according to G uh, Jesus in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, which he says, Hey, if you guys are willing to believe it, Elijah has come. John the Baptist was Elijah. So that part was already fulfilled. So if John the Baptist was Elijah, then guess who Jesus is, according to the prophecy of the Old Testament? He is the Messiah. 
because the Elijah was supposed to come to prepare the way for the Messiah. So Elijah, then Messiah. So guess what happens? We have John the Baptist, who was Elijah in that sense, who was preparing the way for the Messiah. But even that, they rejected. And they said, maybe he's Elijah. Because if they keep him as Elijah, they're still able to say, but he's not God. He's just a preparer. We just need to look for somebody else. And to this day, people are still trying to look for somebody else. Nevertheless, the people were willing to say that Jesus was Elijah or the one to come and son of God, but not willing to submit and be influenced by Jesus, that he not only came from God, but is God and the Messiah who was to come. Society is willing to say that Jesus is a good person and does everything well and in excellence, but not willing, as Elijah represented, to turn people to the true God. When Elijah came, his ministry was to turn people to the real God and away from Baal. You guys remember he killed all those prophets? He did that, that, that thing that uh, he was like, man, rain a, a fire from heaven and, and burn all that up, show them that you're the true God. He did that because his mission was to turn people back to God, to the true God. So guess how they look at Jesus? His, he's not the true God. He's just another way to God. He's an option. Amen? He's an option. If society only believes that Jesus is Elijah, then they have no true reason to fully turn to God in repentance and allegiance to God. They remain influenced by society while carrying around a false allegiance of God through verbal assent, but deny Jesus through their societal allegiance and influence that went above the influence of Jesus. They believe them to be a miracle worker as Elijah was and as a man of God, but the power of society's influence kept them bound to society's ways false truths, and way of living, and that apart from Christ. Have you been influenced by the power of society? The last thing they bring up was one of the prophets. A prophet was a messenger of God who was not God, let alone the Messiah of God. Society would accept Jesus' message, but not enough to influence them to his true identity above the influence of society. If Jesus is just another prophet, we don't have to honor what he has to say. Because he is not God, let alone the Messiah, and who, and who he influenced people to see and believe. He was unable to do that because their influence came from society. Why are these three people important? Because these are the same type of people that society would say that's who Jesus is. But they would never acknowledge that he's the true Messiah and the Son of God. Because that comes with responsibility. It comes with ownership. And so in closing this, in all these false declarations of Jesus, we see society esteem Jesus as a good person. Thank God they at least do that, right? They say he's a good person, right? Um, he was a devout, he was a man who was devout, right, to God, and to be honored as an honorable man. The influence of society will have people esteem Jesus as a preparer of the way, just like uh, 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 John the Baptist was, right, and Elijah and so forth. Living such, a, uh, living such as the golden rule, they won't even adopt some of his teachings. The golden rule, man, we got to treat people like we want to be treated. But really, they, they really just want people to, you know what I mean, to act like they act. You know what I mean, and be about what they act. That's society, right? But they'll use little messages of Jesus. They would even say, hey, he's a miracle worker and a devout godly man as Elijah. And they would even consider him a prophet as the Muslims do and as other people do, right? As a messenger of God, as long as these things never equate to who he truly is, the Messiah and the Son of God. Many people have fallen prey, even believers, have fallen prey to the powerful influence of society and have remained unchanged or born again due to their inability to be influenced by the real Jesus. We will use Jesus to make minor changes in our lives, allow him to influence us as a man and even a miracle worker. But if we never come to the true confession of Jesus, our lives will never exhibit the true identity of our confession of Jesus. If we remain influenced by the culture and society, we would only claim Jesus as a person no greater than the Lord. Society remains in such influence because the moment society declares Jesus as Messiah and God, it will be subject to obey and be obliged to truly honor him. Stand.